first lecture of our new Arwolvian lecture series hosted today by the University of Michigan Museum of Art and presented by 88.3 FM WCBN FM University of Michigan Ann Arbor's student-run community radio station thank you for being here WCBN is one of the longest running freeform stations in the country proud to present alternative programming and challenge the boundaries of radio as a medium for communication Look around for after the presentation for more info about radio and how to get involved, and for free stickers. This is our Wolf's third decade at WCBN, and we are celebrating him tonight. I just want to give a thank you to Bennett Stein for putting this event together. Thank you to Ben English for our publicity materials, to our, <laughs> to our student musicians, and to everyone else who helped put this together. We are broadcasting the, this performance as we speak on 88.3 FM and WCBN.org. So feel free to make noises, because you're on the radio right now. Oh, no. <laughs> and now... I think it's time to face the music with our Wolf Arf and the Modified Starch Ensemble. Thank you. I thought it would be nice to begin with something from Artur Rimbaud. So, um, let's see. Why don't you two just give me... Oh, actually, you were going to do a little convivial welcoming piece, weren't you? It sort of felt like that's what you did before, but I know you have something else in mind. So Artur Rimbaud would like you to please play something convivial for us. Okay. <laughs> this is Alex and Brandon. Thank you. 
guys are amazing. This is the closest any of us will ever come to hearing Joe Venuti and Eddie Lang live in person. <laughs> and if you don't recognize those names, check them out on record. It's a lot like what these guys have been listening to, right? Am I right? Uh -huh. Yeah. I love you guys. Thank you for being here tonight. Good people. Okay, um, let's see. If I was going to read some lines from Arturo Rimbaud to you, what kind of sounds would you generate for that? If you don't know, don't make any sound. But if you, if you have a, a feeling, you ever read any Rimbaud? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's say... One of the heroes of Surrealism before Surrealism was called Surrealism, 19th century French poet. Remember the poem that was at the beginning of the text that I sent you? Give me some tones. I'll read you a poem. When we are strong, who retreats? When we're happy, who feels ridiculous? When we are cruel, what can be done with us? Dress up, dance, Laugh. I could never throw love out the window. We're in an art museum. Gary Snyder, in his book Mountains and Rivers Without End, traces the origin of the word art to the Greek word artem meaning earring that which dangles well connected of course in the other sense of well connected boy it's bullseye right money an interesting experience to be in an art museum improvising together. Art. I'd rather be an artist a man than you. Can you say that again? If you're an artist... <laughs> How many people have read Forces in Motion, the, uh, the book on Anthony Braxton by Graham Locke. Okay. Should be required reading at the University of Michigan. We're working on that. <laughs> Some of this is pulled from there. So these are from the thoughts of Anthony Braxton. Let's discuss the relationship between creative music and what Braxton calls the spectacle diversion syndrome. Or what America has rather than culture. We have a mainstream culture that is not only racist, but peculiarly hostile to alternative value systems, especially those from within its own world culture group minority populations. Mainstream culture values spectacle, what is of interest, rather than substance what is of use for living. That is entertainment rather than creativity. 
The spectacle diversion syndrome is an integral part of American culture's vibrational whining. It is the chief means by which alternative or protest movements, like the beatniks and the hippies, are turned into fads and so absorbed into mainstream culture. It creates the illusion of change, fashion, so as to prevent real fundamental change from taking place. It represents the constant movement of nothing to nothing. One hundred years ago, Arnold Schoenberg said, culture today means to know a little of everything without understanding anything. Did he have the internet? <laughs> Did he use Google? He was on to it a hundred years, 1911. Schoenberg, je repète, culture today means to know a little of everything without understanding anything. I don't know. I can't figure it out. <laughs> okay, let's get down to the, uh, the main order of business here. Why are we still using the term avant-garde? This military term has been used since about 1890 to designate the most progressive elements in an artistic field. But how else has it come to be used? How has it been thrown around, particularly since the middle of the 20th century? This term, avant-garde, has been used as a brickbat, a bludgeon, a quarantine flag, and an epitaph. Message and meaning are engendered by use of the term avant-garde. The signal, for the most part, is watch out. This might not be your cup of tea. It'll probably be weird. <laughs> and it's likely to be unpleasant. You don't have to listen or look or subject yourself to it in any way if you don't want to. It's esoteric. Not for everybody. Obscure. Which means it's hard to see. Hardly surprising if we hide it away, right? I ask you, how can something composed 100 years ago still be avant-garde? Is there an avant-garde tradition? What is tradition? From the Latin, tradere, same root as trade, meaning something handed along. Convention, on the other hand, means get with the goddamn program and conform. Conventionally, avant-garde is a seedbed 
for textures and ideas that help keep pop culture from smothering in its own vapidity. Conventionally, Weyburn and Schoenberg are used by Hollywood as triggers for suspense. There's a guy with a knife. Shostakovich, string quartet number eight in C minor, Allegro Molto. Bernard Herrmann for Alfred Hitchcock. Ode to Psycho in a wig at the head of the stairs. Now, avant-garde implies linear movement. The vanguard is in advance of the majority. But I say to you that we are beyond linearity. We have expanded far beyond the boundaries of fundamental postmodernism, where we learned how to defer judgment and simply say, there it is. That's a beautiful stance. We learned it from John Cage. There it is. It's a way of life at WCBN-FM. It's part of our mission. There it is. As a people, now at our best, we are moving in great spiraling currents of post-linearity. You have the potential to do that every time you're online or in a used record store independently owned, right? Listen to 1921 or 1723. You have that power. I would say with the introduction of electronic sampling, that's when we really became nonlinear. And there's no going back. So don't give me this linear nonsense. I'm never in the mood for this linearity. As for avant-garde, why are we using this term lifted directly from military theory by 19th century French literary and theatrical critics who like to quarrel among themselves? In 1864, Charles Baudelaire noted the predilection of the French for military metaphors, including literature militant, le poète de combat, and literature d'avant-garde. Baudelaire felt that these expressions represented an attitude of conformism. I think it was Woodrow Wilson who said that war demands conformity. War demands conformity. And the term avant-garde is really inseparable from the war model. In order to fully comprehend the implications of the war model, it may be useful to consult the definitive philosophy of land warfare as articulated in the 19th century by Karl von Clausewitz. Okay, this is all from Clausewitz now. Clausewitz says, war is nothing but a duel on a larger scale. War is an act of force with which we compel our enemy to do our will. Force to counter opposing force equips itself with the inventions of art and science. Attached to force, are certain self-imposed, imperceptible limitations hardly worth mentioning, known as international law and custom, but they scarcely weaken it. Force 
force, that is physical force, for moral force, says Clausewitz, has no existence save as expressed in the state in the law, is thus the means of war. To impose our will upon the enemy is our object. To secure that object, we must render the enemy powerless. And that, in theory, is the true aim of warfare. That aim takes the place of the object. Discarding it is simply not actually part of war itself. This is Clausewitz, the great humanitarian. War is such a dangerous business, he says, that the mistakes which come from kindness are the very worst. He says, war is an act of force. There's no logical limit to the application of that force. Each side compels its opponent to follow suit. A reciprocal action is started which must lead, in theory, to extremes. But you can go to the extreme or any of that. The aim of warfare is to disarm the enemy. Now, is this the right source for a term to be applied to creativity, improvisation, and imagination? War is the collision of two living forces. So long as I have not overthrown my opponent, I am bound to fear that he may overthrow me. Very progressive. Very conducive to mindful cultural collaboration. I am not in control. He dictates to me as much as I dictate to him. In the field of abstract thought, the inquiring mind can never rest until it reaches the extreme, for here it is dealing with an extreme, a clash of forces freely operating and obedient to no law but their own. War is never an isolated act. War does not consist of a single sharp blow. War is no pastime. It is a serious means to a serious end. It is the continuation of policy by other means. All wars can be considered acts of policy. Advance guard, avant-garde, advance guard and outposts belong to the category of measures where the threads of tactics and strategy are interwoven. They shape the engagement and ensure that the tactical plan is carried out. They, that is the advance guard and outposts, are the links in the chain of strategy. Any force that is not completely ready for battle needs an advance guard to detect, survey, and evaluate the enemy's approach. Troops on the move are preceded by a force of varying strength as vanguard or advance guard, which will become the rear guard should the line of march be reversed. Now, nobody ever told you that at art school, did they? And should the line of march be reversed, you're going to get shot in the head and in the ass, okay? This is a great metaphor for art, don't you think? Beautiful. The effectiveness of the advance guard and the outpost ranges from simple observation to actual resistance. Well, I think that's in line with where we are, yeah? An advanced corpse derives its operational value more from its presence than from its efforts. Thank you very much. In the commentary from this uh, book where I got these quotes from Clausewitz, and I've had quite enough of him, I'm sure you have too, uh, the, the commentary by Bernard Brody, he says, Clausewitz was curiously negative about the quality we call imagination. 
After stressing the importance of what he calls a sense of terrain and locality, Clausewitz says, we attribute this ability, that is, having a sense of terrain and locality, we attribute this ability to the imagination. But this is about the only service that war can demand from this frivolous goddess, who in most military affairs is liable to do more harm than good. So Clausewitz had no use for the goddess of imagination on the battlefield. He took the time to put it right out there in black and white for us. I want to stop and acknowledge my wife, Lindsay Forbes, who is at home with a very bad cold tonight. Everyone say, hello, Lindsay. Hi, Lindsay. Lindsay turned me on to a poet when we first met. She said, do you read Diane de Prima? Anybody here ever read any Diane de Prima? Yeah, 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 right. She's actually a, a very wonderful poet, and you should be considering her in the same mind breath with her friends Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg and Lou Welch and Philip Whalen and Gary Snyder and all of those people. Uh, but of course, we love to push women aside in this culture, in most cultures on this planet. So Diane de Prima has been pushed aside a lot. But in one of her pieces called Rant, from a book called Pieces of a Song, she says something I want you to carry in your skull for a while here and in your heart. Diane de Prima said, the only war that matters is the war against the imagination. All other wars are subsumed in it. We're very near to a glacier on one of the Alps out hiking with Anton Weber. He's carrying his botanical lexicon so he can identify the different kinds of heather and lichen up there. Anton von Webern. I'm thinking of André Breton, his first Surrealist manifesto, where he suggests we adopt the perspective of several lives lived at once, and where he salutes beloved imagination. Beloved imagination, what I most like in you is your unsparing quality, says Breton. He complained that we're still living under the reign of logic and how much worse that is today in 2010 when everything is hyper-rationalized. Breton, forbidden as any kind of search for truth which is not in conformance with accepted practices. Breton said the imagination is perhaps on the point of reasserting itself, of reclaiming its rights. He went to Prague in 1935, and in his talk there, he made a reference specifically to music and the immediate, pervading, uncriticizable communication of feeling. He also said, we must not hesitate to bewilder sensation. I don't know what it means, but I like the sound. <laughs> Back to Arnold Schoenberg, 1911. 100 years ago. We seek only to seek further. 
Everything depends upon seeking. The world today seeks many things. And before all else, it has found one thing. Comfort. This ideal, with all its implications, has forced itself even into the world of ideas and makes us more complacent than we have ever dared to be. Today, said Schoenberg, more than ever before, we know how to make life pleasant. Problems are solved to eliminate something unpleasant. But how are they solved? And do we all together believe that they've been solved? Here is seen the essential weakness of the philosophy of comfortableness. It's superficiality. It is easy to have a world outlook if one looks only at that which is pleasant, counting the rest not worthy of your attentions. But actually the rest is much more important. Of course, the world outlooks fit their wearers as if made to measure. But think of it, comfort as a philosophy of life. The least possible commotion. Those who so love comfort will never seek except where there is definitely something to find. So Schoenberg encourages searching for searching's sake. Searching for the sake of the search. I think that's part of our credo at WCBNFM. In fact, I know it is. Anybody who spent any time at all listening or participating on the other end of the transmitter knows what I'm talking about. The willingness to search, a willingness maybe to get run over by something. Maybe to try anything 33 times. I learned that at WCBNFM. Felix Mendelssohn said it is not that music is too imprecise for words, but that it is too precise. John Elliott Gardner said, Johann Sebastian Bach seems to anticipate and substantiate Mendelssohn's belief that music can unleash the, con the central core of meaning so often obfuscated by words. Words, language, so powerful, and how carelessly we use it. The problem with the term avant-garde lies in its origins, its application over time, and in the sloppy way we come to bandy it about. Freedom is a challenge. You decide who you are by what you do. Who said that? That was Hunter S. Thompson. Tom Waits said, I think that nowadays there seems to be a deficit of wonder. And if you wander up into the graduate library, you might find some texts by the German poet Friedrich Hoderlin. That's what I've been doing since I've got a job at the University of Michigan. I get off the clock, I go up there and raid this place. Pull stuff out of Bure, left and right, right? Why is it in storage? Hooterlin said, we all traverse an eccentric orbit, and there's no other path from childhood to the finish that is possible for us. I was reading up on Hooterlin, 
and a, a, a scholar, Sabina Menner Betshed, from a book on Holderlin called The Recalcitrant Art. He says, supreme simplicity is sometimes granted by nature, but sometimes achieved by formation and struggle, the latter necessitating something like eccentricity. Eccentricity is not mere oddity, but the off-centered, the dual-centered, two centers, the bipolar ellipse, For the Greeks, an ellipse is a shortfall and a shortcoming. For Holderlin and for us, it is a way of life and poetry. The eccentric orbit that the human being, in general and as an individual, traverses from one point of a more or less pure simplicity to another of a more or less accomplished formation seems in its essential directions to be always identical. Identity is eccentricity. Holderlin knew that his part was fire from heaven and all the dissonances of the earth. That's what Sabina said. That doesn't sound much like music to me. Dissonance. It's a lovely word, dissonance. Cognitive dissonance. Consonance. Assonance, internal rhyming. There's room for everything up in here. Although it is strictly relative, Dissonance was regarded with sus suspicion for generations until towards the end of the 19th they began to speak of the emancipation of the dissonance. And then the dissonance itself made it clear to one and all that it would emancipate itself. Thank you very much. And dissonance has been self-emancipating ever since. This is a dissonant-assed world. And all of this, all of this music that is considered dissonant and avant-garde and any other term that once they want to put on it is a perfectly rational response to the way things really, really are. You mean this is the real world? Huh? <laughs> I never thought of that. Every music is a reflection of its day, filled with reverberations from what has come before and premonitions of that which is yet to come. For something that magical and nonlinear to be simultaneously reduced to war games and superficiality spelled out on the front page arts and entertainment how dare you it's like okay here I am get me off I'm waiting don't waste my time or my world-renowned attention span come on get me off <laughs> hurry it up Rats off not that getting off isn't important. It's just been overemphasized. I'm the last person in the world to minimize the importance of getting off and finding someone wonderful for getting off with. But transformation is more relevant in the long run. Transformation and ritual, you know? Entertainment. Entertainment so overdone is often best when the initial object was not to entertain. Ornette Coleman pointing out the parallels of art forms, the comparative developments in music 
and her sister Arts. Ornette, who composed, he said, the way a geodesic dome is put together. Or Cecil Taylor, pianist, poet, dancer, architect. If we drop the blanket terminology of avant-garde, what's really happening may be better seen and understood as itself without the billboard to shove it into the categorical niche. And I see no, hear no contradiction between Muha Richard Abrams and Domenico or Alessandro Scarlatti. Centuries and cultures collapse and expand in one fleshy kaleidoscope of continuous reality. And yet, here we have a culture almost completely shaped and controlled by marketing, rather than marketing in the service of culture. It's not like this everywhere. The USA is notorious for it. The original act of branding, burning a logo into the flesh of an animal with heated iron. Every day we are selling, says the business school graduate. Every minute of every day, selling. When you defecate, you are selling. Uh, can you guys do a lullaby texture? Lullaby. First thing that comes to mind. Psalm of Life for Thomas Dodd. There are as many genders as there are individuals. There are as many kinds of sexuality as there are individuals. There are as many kinds of spirituality as there are individuals. There are as many kinds of individuals as there are individuals. Meditation for Mark Morell. We're more like ants than ants are. Because we try too hard. Somewhere, somehow, in the long wipe, we became obsessed with patterns of war. War is for ants. And we're more like ants than ants are. You have no answer. You can see, ants are savage, ruthless, and courageous. Thank you know, Obama. 
on to. Okay. Namaskar. Modified Starch Ensemble. My name is R. Wolf R. Wolf, and we're broadcasting and streaming live over WCBN FM and WCBN.org. I'd like to introduce the people who have been kind enough to come down here and collaborate. And you guys are brave. I mean, these people have never worked together before. They came down here tonight. Most of us hadn't even, uh, a lot of us hadn't even met before. And I want to thank you very much for participating tonight. In fact, we can. Keep going after I talk. Yeah. See, we've got Dr. Ed Special over here raising hell with his laptop. Our uh, circadian maraca man, who I invited to sneak in here tonight, Mr. Jerry Mack. Guitarist Alex Bellage. His chum violinist Brandon Smith. And 
violinist Eleanor Yuri Dumochel. Our bassoonist, and I can't believe I lucked out to have a bassoonist named Daniel Beowulf Goldblum. Here he is. I love this guy. Each of these people are just very dear to me. I'm so, so deeply moved that they've come down here to participate tonight. Uh, why don't you thank guitarist Kirsten Carey. And mothership percussionist Jeremy Malvin. I think at this point we would like to uh, just give you an improvisation where um, I will say things that pop into my head after I give a legal ID. And I think what we're um, what we're going to do is carry on for a while, and then at some point, probably after about a half hour of this nonsense. Um, you're going to start something that will sustain itself, and then you're going to walk back to WCBN and then duet with yourself for a minute. It's going to be in two places at once when he's not anywhere at all, which is kind of hard to do. So um, let's give the legal ID. This is WCBN FM Ann Arbor, 88.3 megahertz. We are the voice of the underground intellectual resistance movement. Experimental, experiential radio, broadcasting from the University of Michigan. We are student-run, with lots and lots of community involvement. And I wouldn't have it any other way, would you? <laughs> Let's talk about WCBN for a minute, while you guys start to make some more sounds. Give me, a, give me some sounds over which to talk about WCBN FM. Let's see. We were originally located in the Residential College in East Quad, right? And very gradually moved over to the Student Activities Building. In fact, we're one of the last student activities. Gary or Greg? Public invited? Okay. okay. Food. Right. Okay. So let's let's do that. I don't know exactly when that's going to happen. Maybe we can we can fly Bennett in from wherever he's uh, he's at. Because again, this idea, Bennett Stein insisted we do this now in December, rather than waiting. I was like, no, let's go to January. You know. But Bennett's going to be. Uh, you're switching. Where are you going to, Bennett? You're going to New York for a semester. What part of New York? Really? My dad was from the Bronx. So. Yeah, check it out. It's still there. Um, but, but this is, I, I just want to say one more time, I'm so blessed that I get to work at WCBN, and I have for so long. I've met so many wonderful people. It's just an precious thing in the world. If anything keeps me in Ann Arbor, this, this station does. Thank you. It's true. It's here. It's here. Thank you.
with something really cockamamie, like a Spike Jones record. Okay, we'll play that all the way through. But for the most part, they'd play a song just long enough so that you could get, get it, and you'd understand why it was included in the show. Oh, this is a show about shoes, and they just mentioned shoes. Hooray! You know, and they go on to the big last segue into the next song. It was insane. It was like the fastest moving hour in radio. Because you'd never go more than sometimes you'd go like half a verse into a song, you know. And they would do these these neck snapping segues from you know George Jetson records to Amos and Andy to I mean, just all over the place. And it was really very much what I was getting involved with was part of the heart and soul of WCBN's willingness to listen to anything. The WCBN taught me to listen to anything. You know, I was already listening to a lot of stuff when I came to CBN. But CBN taught me to listen to N.A. things. And really to investigate. And not to get let myself get in the way of the listening experience. And that's really what listening to WCBN necessitates. You have to get rid of your ego a little bit. Leave your ego over here. Who cares what you like? I mean, what you like is really important. I'm glad you like it, okay? Good. But if it's all about what you like, I like this, it's Facebook. Like, you know. So what? Okay, like, like, like. When I was growing up, like was a soda for, Remember that? The feminine refresher? Just for girls? Like? Right? What are you talking about, you know? Is there any substance? We're back to Schoenberg again. Can we have something s substantive here? I can't pronounce it right. But you know what I'm... <laughs> exactly. So if you end up liking something, not because you started out to like it, but because you're alive and you're thinking for yourself. And then you really, well, I really like this. I had no idea I was going to like this. You know, I used to, for many years, I would, I would do this radical vegetarian thing on Thanksgiving. You remember this? I'd play hogs being slaughtered on Thanksgiving. You know? I'd always play like Lee Harvey Oswald being shot in the stomach with lounge music under it, and then hogs being slaughtered. You know? I had some stuff to work out, you know. Um, so I still play Lee Harvey Oswald being shot in the stomach with lounge music. I can't get away from that. I have done so many different Oswald mixes. You wouldn't believe, but. It's great, you know, I, I, did a, I did an Oswald It's Your Thing mix once, it was, it was great. But um, I used to actually get people calling me up and say, could you play some more hogs being slaughtered? And I Until, you know, Lindsay convinced me it's unnecessarily cool. She said, come on, schmuck, listen to them. They're, the animals are frightened. Don't, do the, don't put that over there. So she's right, because animals get a pretty rough deal in this world. So I'm trying to be a little more kind as I get a little older, but I'm not giving up the central mission of Face the Music or what I see as the central mission of, of WCBN-FM, which, which is to see to it that people keep thinking for themselves and using their brains and using their imaginations and not just liking what they're told to like. That's how we got... This is how we got... George W. Bush, right? This is how we've got eight years of Ronald Reagan. Well, we hate everything he's doing, but can we like him? Well, I didn't like him. You like him? But a lot of people said that. Oh, we completely object to everything he's doing, but God, what a guy, you know? Well, I don't know what they were falling for. Kind of morbid, really, you know? But it was, it's really strange seeing this happen again and again and again, where all they have to do is figure out how to press the like buttons on enough people, and they can get away with anything that's on their agenda, whoever they happen to be. You fill in that blank. But you know what I'm talking about? You figured it out. So anyway, there I was uh, in the late 70s, participating in this Cornwall Symphony show. And I started to realize, you know, this is really in my DNA. 
my parents met in a radio station, WBNX, in New York, in what, 1939, 1940? He was the painfully shy engineer. She was the gorgeous Polish broadcasting announcer. Helen Biedoskiewicz. And they got set up on a date because he was too shy to even ask her to even talk to her, you know? So it didn't even occur to me when I got into radio that, oh, this is, I'm doing what my parents did. And it, it didn't at all. It was a, a visceral sensation that this is it. And Tony Aldis is nodding here. He knows exactly what I'm talking about. Any of the people who have made a commitment here, Sean Westergaard knows what I'm talking about, who made these commitments, not just because we're us and we need to, you know, look at me, I'm wonderful. Not at all. What we're there for is we're there because we love the way it works and we see the possibilities and we want to help WCBN change the world in positive ways. That may sound lofty, but it's not at all. It's about as down to earth as you can possibly get. It's getting in there and realizing we have all this freedom and we have this incredible archive of music. And we have these young people like Bennett Stein who just pop up out of nowhere. And the Libs, these people, uh, Kristen, Kumro, these people pop up and suddenly they're doing things and they want us to keep CBN alive and they want it to, to help define how it stays with the mission and help to keep constantly redefining the mission. And it's amazing, I've never seen us cop out, at least not for very long, over 30 years. Right, Tom? It's amazing, it's extraordinary. Largely because we have such a great board of directors and all the other students whose names I have not mentioned and all of the other alumni. There's so many people who've been part of this radio station as actively on that side of the transmitter. And you put that together with all of the people who are on the receiving end, and it's really pretty extraordinary. It's really one of the most precious elements here at the University of Michigan. And I, I think we should all be very, very proud of WCBN. I think it's a, a miracle. So how did I start to do Face the Music? I mean, I may as well keep going, right? Is this irritating yet? I'm going to keep going for a few more minutes. Uh, let's see. It was um, New Year's Day, 1980, I think. And the program director at that time, Judy Schwartz, she was over at a, I had this big old house over on this side of town, and we had this one of, the, one of my notorious house parties over New Year's Eve. And she woke up in the morning and she, <laughs> excuse me, she went up. And I came into my music room and she was standing there kind of bleary eyed, looking at this whole wall of 78 RPM records, you know. And she sort of turned and looked at me and said, We got to get you a radio show, boy, you know. Not just sitting in, because I'd been sitting in with uh, people all over the place, like an asteroid running around. So she decided to give me this Thursday night 7 to 8 slot. And she said, what do you want to call your show? And I said, well, um, how about you've got to be modernistic? Because I had a recording. Uh, from a Fats Waller record, uh, Fats Waller and James P. Johnson, and a frantic, you've heard, these, you've heard these guys, a real frantic vocal group called the Keep Shuffling Trio. You've got to be modernistic! And, from 1929, real hot shot stuff. So every week we'd play that at the beginning and I'd sort of talk over it. And I was such an obnoxious person. Get on the air. And I would say the most god awful things, you know? And I'd go to these flea markets and I'd find these you know, Ford Tractor Division, Food, Fiber, and Ford. I still play that sometimes, you know. Three billion people share this earth. That kind of thing. <laughs> These dopey-ass records. And, you know, I play the, hey, look, I have two different editions of the Charles Manson record. Ha, 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 ha. You know? And, and uh, 
you know, play, play a song from that and then back to back with the, the song that he forced the Beach Boys to record that he wrote. Have you ever heard that? It was, called, it was called Cease to Exist. That's a nice name for a Manson song. Cease to Exist, Say That You Love Me, you know. And they, they changed it. He almost killed them because they changed the arrangement. <laughs> but uh, they changed it to Never Learn Not to Love. It was on, on the album 2020. Some people would say, why are you bothering us with this, 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 this stuff? Hey, it's part of our cultural detritus. You know, it's part of our collective story. So to me, it's relevant. I mean, I still play, you know, if, depending on what goes on in the elections, uh, not long ago, I played the Nazi stormtroopers singing uh, <laughs> Raise the Banner, you know. They were the great flag worshipers, those guys, you know. So it's, it's having the ability to, you know, and the freedom to carefully present things that maybe you, not everybody could, could do that. Because you have to be ready to explain why you're doing what you're doing if you're doing that kind of radio. And when, I, when, I, when people apprentice with me, that's one of the first things I say, right? Is you've got, you've got to be, you're very responsible for what you're doing here. And you can, I guess that's taking a big chance. I mean, you're pulling up some of the most horrible gunk in the world and putting it on the radio. How are you gonna present that? It's all about context. It's just like, the entire history of art is about different ways of seeing, right? So that's what, to me, what radio is, is different ways of seeing. Now, you've heard this very recently because uh, you, you sat in with me as, a, as an apprentice on, on this show, on, on uh, Face the Music. Actually, we're into Ed's special show at this point. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite things to tell um, apprentices is that really what we're about at WCBN is this, this remarkable range of freedom and discipline. Freedom and discipline. Now, if you're tooling around and you have all freedom and no discipline, what happens? You pile your car into a tree, right? If you have all, in a more general sense, all discipline and no freedom, where are you? You are in jail, right? So, that was shaking Jake, by the way. I'm so glad he's here with us tonight. So what we're looking for is that wonderful common ground between piling your car into a tree and being in jail. <laughs> Somewhere between those two extremes is WCBNFM. And these poor young people that come and apprentice with me, that's the kind of nonsense they listen to <laughs> while I'm playing this weird, hey, you want to hear some tap dance instruction records? <laughs> you know? Because it's there. There it is. It's there. I grew up in the 20th century. There it is. It's just there. You know? You're going to tell me whether or not, oh, I don't know. Uh, I think Andy Warhol's Chelsea Girls was an attempt at the avant-garde, but it didn't work. Well, that's not what I experienced when I saw it, right here in Angel Hall Auditorium A, and Undine was touring with it. Right? You remember that? Yeah, it didn't, I didn't come away with that impression, did you? It was weird. It was weird, <laughs> but more importantly, it was there. It was just there, man. I mean, that's, that's the whole point of Andy. I mean, Empire State Building, <laughs> there it is, you know? And it, I just love that aspect. That's what I learned in the 20th century. Shut up, it's just there, you know, and, and that doesn't, you could probably put a lot of critics out of business that way because, you know, they need to like, so, so unless, unless they did what I think critics should really do, which is to describe. Just to describe. It can be done. How would you describe how you feel at this point with your musical instruments? How do you feel? Powerful? Beowulf feels powerful. <laughs> Give me a little taste, man. Mm. Yeah, I think so. Do that again, and why doesn't everyone come in underneath him and explain your notion of feeling powerful to him?
the bridge. thinking of this Mohawk Richard Abrams album where I mean Claudine Myers keeps saying hey man what key are we in there are as many different keys as there are individuals oxygen in this room with us tonight. What we're about to do is to conduct a uh, typical remote experiment whereby Dr. Ed Special is going to initiate a uh, something that is going to sustain itself even though he's not going to be sitting there. And he's going to walk to the radio station and then he's going to do it with himself. <laughs> That's up to you, man. It's your show. So uh, let's thank again. Let me uh, 
quickly, I, I really want to say their names one more time because I'm so fortunate to be able to work with these people here tonight. Our uh, percussionist, Jeremy Malvin, one more time. Our amplified guitarist, Kirsten Carey. Our bassoonist, Daniel Beowulf Goldblum. First chair violinist, Eleanor Yuri Dumachel. And the remarkable violinist, Brandon Smith. Wonderful to have a jazz violinist in here. I wasn't aware that that was going to happen. Luckily, he was invited by Alex Belhaj, the guitarist. Once again, our, uh, our blues man, Jerry Mack, who played maracas. The clear range disruption. And this is my dear friend, Ed Special. And I'm so glad that he was with us tonight. And, uh, I would like to suggest the next time that we do this, and this is the first in a series of lectures, if you can stand it, I'd love to talk once in a while to you and to other people who come. Uh, I'd like to suggest we do the next one at WCBN in Pride A in the studio, and it'd be like an open house. Is that scary or good? Yeah. Public invited? Is that good? OK. Food? Right. Okay, so let's, let's do that. I don't know exactly when that's going to happen. Maybe we can, we can fly Bennett in from wherever he's, uh, he's at. Because again, this idea, Bennett Stein insisted we do this now in December rather than waiting. I was like, no, let's go to January, you know. But Bennett's going to be, uh, you're switching. Where are you going to, Bennett? I'm just going to New York for the semester. I'll be back in the fall. You're going to New York for a semester? Yeah. What part of New York? Uh, probably in Brooklyn. Really? Oh, yeah. My dad was from the Bronx. Yeah. So, yeah. Hopefully yeah, check it out. It's yeah. still there. <laughs> um, there it is. But, but this is, I, I just want to say one more time, I'm so blessed that I get to work at WCBN, and I have for so long. I've met so many wonderful people through this place. It is just the most precious thing in the world. If anything keeps me in Ann Arbor, this, this station does. So. Saving the world one year at a time. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true. Thank you. 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 Thank you.